Welcome, everybody. Welcome to City Point Church. Hey, Pastor. Good morning. How is everybody? Candace is good. We're all good. There you go. Amen. All right, Paul. I wanted to say good morning to everybody and let you know what things are going on here at the House of City Point. We have a Westville Correctional Conference coming up, and it's not coming up until May. However, what needs to happen is the paperwork needs to get into Pastor Julie over there in the dark. She's waving. If you have an application that was emailed to you or you have one, please get that into her if you plan on going by March 1st. That is a deadline, right? Hard and fast. The second thing is women, do I have your attention? Everybody say yes. All right, women. We have a conference coming up that's called Stronger. And we'll tell Tammy and Dawn it's the 28th and 29th. <laughs> we, so they haven't missed it. We're so excited. We want you to come out. If you haven't registered, please come and see me after. I'll be more than happy to put your name down. We have also some scholarships still available. So if you are in need of, uh, you want to come but you don't have the funds, don't let that stop you. We have that taken care of. God has already saw fit. So we want you to do that. This evening at 6 o'clock, Pastors Vince and Letitia will be doing their, con their uh, transformation discipleship. So please come out. We want to see your face. If you haven't been there already, it doesn't matter. Come on out. We'll fold you into the class. We'd love for you to come. Um, ladies, again, in May, May 1st through the 3rd, You've got nothing on your schedule yet, so it should not be a problem. May 1st through the 3rd, Dawn and Tammy, Tammy Rourke, two different last names, they have been uh, put this on their heart to do something for the women to get away. So you need $10 to make a deposit. Is that correct? We want to know if you're coming. Come out. Have some fun at the campground there. We'd love to see you. So please see Dawn or Tammy. Rave, can you stand up? Stand up, ladies. Okay, take a bow. We'd love to have you. <laughs> we are red getting ready to worship, so I want your hearts to get prepared. Enter in the King of Glory this morning. Good morning, city peeps. Easter, I will be eating those peeps. I hate those things. Trust me out. All my chicken, it tastes like chicken. This is Let the Redeem, so I need you to sing with me because you're all redeemed. All right, here we go. So let
bellberries joy in the morning springing up in my soul there's a life worth living cause he calls me his own there's a hallelujah after sweet victory there's no sound louder than the captive said forevermore just like his church pour out your thankfulness and let it overflow in the land of the of the Lord say so way to be sing that. Repeat that. You are here, moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, 
working in this place I worship you I worship you Cause you are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are you. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship you, I worship you, cause you are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are a way maker, a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Cause you are a way maker, a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God. don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working because even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel you work in. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work in. Even when I don't feel it, you work in. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it. Darkness, my God, 
That is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are.
surrounding me, let it break at your name and peace. You bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. I don't know. I mean, you guys know we can surround ourselves with walls. In my heart, what God has shown me today is even I, as I'm up here standing, I have just barricaded myself. There's not even a ceiling. Do you ever just feel like you're stuck in a cave? Where no one can hear you and you don't even want to be heard you don't know what you want but when we were singing that Jesus you make the darkness tremble I could see my cave breaking as I just cried out like my mom preached last Sunday Jesus 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 I need you in this dark cave Jesus I need you to break these walls down Jesus I need you to show me the light I need you to show me the way God I need out of here I need out when we were singing J song earlier the way maker I could just feel like and I don't know if it was just me but how superficial our praise was we were just on the surface because we're in this cave and we just want people to know that we're okay but we're not okay we need the Lord to guide us. We need the Lord to take us out of this. We need to worship him, people. We need to get on down to the bottom of the roots. 
We don't just need to pull up the little dandelions, the heads off, we need to get them out. So I just want to encourage you that today, if you feel like you are in a dark place, if you feel like you've buried yourself in a cave or if someone's put you in a hole, you need to get on up here and praise. You need to get on up here and worship. You need to fight your battle right here at this altar. God is here and he is moving and if you don't grasp on, then well, that's your fault. Hello, can I get a witness, somebody? Because God is removing our, God is removing so much today. God is removing darkness. God is removing depression. God is removing suicidal thoughts. God is removing bad reports. God is removing bad habits. God is strengthening family bonds. God is strengthening our own bones. We just sang it. He's going to be alive because in our bones. He's bringing our bones back to life, people. So we just need to call upon his name, Jesus.
Jesus. One of, uh, one of the greatest feelings I've ever felt in my life was victory uh, in athletics, like winning a big game. And I almost feel that right now, like we, we just won a championship or something. I feel a victory in this room. I feel... I don't know if you guys are feeling the same thing, but it was almost hard for me to come up here because I, I just sense that God is having so many victories this morning in so many lives, in so many ways, so many different ways. And this was a week of victory for me. And uh, anybody have victories in their life this week? You know, because this gospel, this Jesus, this isn't just highs and lows, but there's a lot of victories when you walk with God. And so throughout the week, uh, I wanted to share with you guys some of the victories uh, through Scripture that the Lord was teaching me. So it, my week started, and I was reading in Job chapter 38, and it was, it was after Job was complaining to the Lord, and all this was happening in his life, and then the Lord finally responded to Job. And it says in chapter 38, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Who is that? Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man. I can imagine Job right there. Because I have some questions for you, Job, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you know so much, who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundation and who laid its cornerstone? The morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Going on in verse 16, it says, Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Going on to verse 24, it says, Where is the path 
to the source of light? Where is the home to the east wind? Who created a channel for the torrents of rain? And so when I was reading this, I realized that we serve a huge God, okay? We serve such a big God, and this week was a victory for me because God was expanding my view of him, of how great he really is, okay? And so from Job chapter 38, it went on to Luke chapter 8 for me, and I was reading, and you know, Luke chapter 8 is, is a chapter that I've read over and over and over again, and so I'm reading this after reading Job chapter 38, realizing that we serve such a mighty God, and sometimes things don't look how we think they should look. Anybody excited that God's ways are higher than our ways, right? That his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so Jesus is in this boat and this storm is there. And the disciples wake up Jesus. We all know the, the, the story. And Jesus says silence and the storm calms. Okay, and then they get out of the boat. And there's this demon-possessed uh, man that comes up to him that's been possessed for so long. And they can't, even, they can't even chain this man down. And so I'm reading this. And this demon that's possessed this man falls before Jesus and is screaming, Jesus, Jesus, I beg you, do not send me into the bottomless pit. Do not send me into the bottomless pit, okay? And so Jesus, he says, what's your name? And the demon says, Legion, for we are many. Okay, and so I'm reading this, realizing that we serve a mighty God. And so this demon's begging and begging and begging, and he's like, please send us into the pigs and not the bottomless pit in hell. Okay, because it's the bottomless pit right now, and then the second coming of Jesus, it's going to be the lake of fire. And so this demon's like, I don't want to go there. And Jesus, literally, like, beyond me, he had mercy on this demon and sent him into pigs instead of sending him to the bottomless pit. Okay, and, and to us, we're like, what the heck? Like me, I would have been like, hey, go straight to hell. Like, you, you mean nothing to me, right? Like, God's ways are so much higher than our ways. And then I'm, I'm reading more, and I'm going further. And then you have this religious leader named Jairus, who's over a local synagogue. And these people over the local synagogue are the ones that are giving Jesus the most trouble, right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees. And so J Jairus, he finally, after so long, he's like, listen, I can't ignore Jesus' miracles. My daughter is dying. I need God to touch my daughter. And so he goes before Jesus, and he says, listen, can you go and heal my daughter? And Jesus says, yes. So they're walking to heal his daughter, and the, we all know the woman with the issue of blood that got healed, right? And so I'm reading this story, and God's just opening my eyes and opening my ears and my heart to this story. And this lady literally touched the, the end of his garment, okay, and gets healed. And so I'm reading a little further, and it says, he says, who touched me? Who touched me in this crowd? And the Bible literally says, all denied that they touched him. So what does that mean? That even she denied. So she lied in, in, in the face of Jesus, okay? She lied that she touched him. And she couldn't get away from it. So she's like, Jesus, it was me. It was me. And he said, daughter, because of your faith, you are healed. Listen, if you lie to me, you step back. Like, I, I'm throwing you out. And it just blew my mind. I'm like, this girl literally just lied to Jesus, and he looked past that because his ways are higher and his ways are greater. Okay, and then going on, right when that healing happens, somebody comes from Jairus' house and says, your daughter died. And in my mind, I'm like, Jesus, if you would have just went, heard, heard your tail up and went straight to her house, you would have got healed, right? But Jesus didn't care. He, was, he, he cared who was in front of him, all right? And then he goes to Jairus' house, and the daughter gets healed. She was dead, and now she's alive. And uh, I actually see Omar. Can you come up here for me? You being here totally just changed everything. <laughs> Omar. Everybody say, hey, Omar. <laughs> so uh, this is actually really crazy because... <laughs> So this week, God put Omar on my heart. <laughs> okay, so I looked him up on Facebook, and I couldn't find him. And I wake up this morning, and Omar messaged me. And he's like, hey, is church at 10 a.m.? 
Oh, man. God is so much bigger. And so Omar right here, when I was at Central Church of God, I was a leader there. And I watched Omar get saved. And Omar's story totally wrecked my life because Omar's dad. Can a guy tell your story a little bit? Okay. Omar's dad, uh, I watched him get saved at a Christian church. And his dad's a Muslim. Okay. And so Omar <laughs> had to walk to church. And he had to hide that he was a Christian in Portage, Indiana. <laughs> not in India, and not in the Middle East, in Portage, Indiana. And he was walking to church for a year. And then his dad started catching on. And his dad didn't, like, he refused to know because he didn't want to disown him. But Omar, Omar's mom recently passed away in December. And it totally rocked his world. Can you attest to that? It's totally, it's changed some things. Anybody in here been rocked by a death lately? My best friend died this year and it rocked me, man. And so I actually wanted, if, if you've experienced a death in the last few years and it's totally rocked your world, can you please come to the front for me? And Omar, can you come in the middle? Polly, some of the elders and pastors in the church, if you have anointing oil. I apologize for taking up so much time. It's... Let's lay hands on Omar. God, I thank you so much for Omar. Lord, I thank you for this mighty man of God. Lord, I thank you that you started a good work in him and you are not done. This wasn't a two-year, three-year thing, God. I thank you for this man's heart. I thank you that he loves you. He has a passion for you, God. And Jesus, I just pray that you just take over right now. I pray any hurt, any, any hurt that he's experienced through this death, Lord, I thank you that you are the resurrection, that you bring all things to life, Jesus. All dead things, things that we... we seem have an end lord i thank you that you raise them up lord i pray right now that you raise up his faith you raise up his boldness god you raise up his courage right now lord Thank you for everybody down here, Jesus. I pray you bless them all. Lord, any hurt that they've been through this year, or this last few years, Lord, any death in the family, any loss of loved ones, God, I pray you bless them right now, Lord. You bless them right now, Lord. I thank you that storms come, but we have you to go through the storms with. We have you to go through the storms with, Jesus. We're not alone. We're not alone, Jesus. Can everybody stretch their hands forward for me? God, we thank you so much for everybody in this place. Lord, I know we're all going through trials and tribulations, Lord, but we can walk in victory. We can walk in victory in the midst of opposition. We can walk in victory in our families. We can walk in victory in our job sites, Lord. I thank you so much that you are renewing strength. You are renewing courage. Lord, you are renewing convictions. Holy Spirit, I pray you come in with your holiness right now, that we are people that seek after your holiness. We are people that hate sin, and we just want to serve you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you guys, amen.
So the last thing the Lord showed me through all this is he's given us victory, but sometimes we got to change things up in our life to walk out that victory. I, it's just like when I was dating girls in the past, I would always walk back into the same the same thing. I, I chose to walk straight back to it, but the moment that I broke it off and changed directions, that's when I started walking in victory. And the Lord has given you the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He has called you his own. He has stamped you with his mark. He has given you the Holy Spirit to seal you. Now you have to change things up and walk that out. And so me and Caden actually made a video, uh, and I was going to play that because uh, th this God has just been expanding He's been showing me that I need to change directions in my life and need to change things up. And so, if you would, watch this video. Something needs to change. What if God is calling you to greater? What if he has more for you than an ordinary life? What if the very reason you feel empty is because you've been in control, not him? What if I told you that God may be allowing discouragement to happen in your life to wake you up to greater purpose in life? And that greater purpose can only be achieved through Christ Jesus. Sometimes you need to just change things up. Put down your normal, put down your Netflix, put down your YouTube, put down your social media and pick up the things of God. Pick up the word, pick up that prayer life, pick up his thoughts and plans for your life. Raise your hands, lift up your voice to him because he has a plan and a purpose for your life that is greater than you could ever hope, dream or imagine. Kill your normal and take on his normal because his ways are better. His ways are greater. His ways are bigger. Today, God is simply saying, change it up. That's my challenge this week. Don't do your normal. Do his normal, okay? And so I love all you guys. Keep walking in victory. I'm excited for the word of God today. But before we get to give, uh, we're going to go into a time of giving. If you need an envelope for offering... Uh, please raise your hand for me. Raise your hand. And we do offering through online giving, text to give, or you can bring your ties up front. So I'm going to pray over the offering. Thank you guys for being a cheerful giver. Uh, I, I challenge you to, to continue in your tithe. The, the tithe is important. Uh, it does amazing things. And uh, God works through it. So, Jesus, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for this morning. Lord, it is so exciting to be in the house of God. It is exciting to know that you love us and you care for us and you have plan and purpose for our life. God, I pray you continue, continue, God, to make ways. When, when it seems like there's no way, you're the way maker, Lord. I thank you so much for the worship. I thank you that we could come together and from all different walks of life and we can unite in worship and lift up your name. And God, we bless the offering right now. Lord, I pray you multiply the offering for the kingdom of God. And we thank you so much for every person who puts in the hours throughout the week, who works their tail off, Lord. I thank you so much for their energy that they're sowing back into the kingdom, that they're giving back to you, Lord. I pray you bless their family because of their gift. You bless their finances because of their gift. You bless their dreams. Give them vision, God, because of their gift, Lord. I thank you that they are sowing and they will reap. 
They are sowing and they will reap, Jesus. In your mighty name, amen. Y'all could come to the front. Amen. Give it up for the worship team. You guys are awesome. God is good. Amen. Some good stuff here this morning. Wow. That's all. I just, every Sunday, I know I just get up here and say, wow. But that's because, wow. <laughs> Let me say it backwards. Wow. I mean, whoo, Jesus. Praise God. God is so good. So many things um, that God is doing. I love this place. I love that God is, God is at work. And um, it's just an amazing thing. You know, I want to say this to some of you because some of you are struggling with the idea of how can God be working and I still be in a situation or still be in the middle of it or you know isn't it, isn't it time to praise him when you're out or you're uh, way on the other side of it and as we were worshiping and praying and ministering and and everything going on I was reminded that um, you know the Lord is always at work in the chaos he's always at work in the midst I was thinking about this a very common verse which You've heard me quote again and again that he gives uh, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. And, I, and, I, and the Lord just gave me a, a different insight into that as we were here to, to, and to tell you that, you know, you can be, you can be in ashes and, and be in beauty too. Because there is no beauty without the ashes. Okay, well, I thought it would. And, uh, and there's real no garment of praise unless you know what heaviness is. And so in the middle of your heaviness, when God puts his garment on you, you know, because this is what conflicts with our mind. It's like, how do I praise God while I'm still in the middle of this? Because that's what faith is all about. It's faith is the ability to stand in the midst of what you are presently in and by faith, give God praise that, that he is working, that in the middle of my heaviness, he puts on me a garment of praise. People look at it and go, I don't get that because I know, I know he's struggling with this heaviness. Or I don't get that. Why, how, can she, how can she appear to be so beautiful in the middle of all the ashes? How, how when she got so burned, can she be so full of of the presence of God, because that's what God is doing. You know, for us, it's all, it's all clean and neat, isn't it? You know, it's all like white or black. But God, I'm telling you, God moves in the shadows, and he moves in the darkness. The Bible says the darkness and the light are alike to him. <laughs> so anyway, I don't want to get off on some side, but I, I need you to know that if you're in the middle of chaos, don't discount the fact that God's at work in it because God specializes in your chaos. And if you've been burned, I just want to say this to you, if you've been burned, God specializes in bringing beauty out of your ashes. And that's what God is doing. And so as we get going here today, I just want to remind you about tonight. Tonight's uh, 
6 o'clock class, which has been amazing. And if you haven't been, you know, it's, you can jump in. It's not like, oh, I missed, I missed the first two and now it's too late. No, it's not at all like that. You can jump in and join us tonight at 6 o'clock as Pastors Vince and Letitia are doing a great job and talking about uh, what it means to really be walking this in a d- discipled kind of way. And, and uh, it's a powerful time and a lot of interaction and some good donuts. So you can't beat, you can't just can't lose. Um, I want to say a word about the upcoming fast, but I'm, I think I'm going to do that as a part of this as I get going here today in the word that God has given me. So if we could get that PowerPoint up here, I want to talk to you today about the harvest and uh, specifically the last harvest, uh, what the Bible talks about in terms of the harvest at the end of the world, uh, which is, I'll explain that as, as we get to it. And, um, and again, this is, a, this is a little different, and I really, man, I put, a, I put a lot of wrestling into this because I believe this is a message that, um, that, that's a challenge to share, and, and at the same time, it's one the enemy doesn't want shared, and I could tell the, the, over the resistance that I was sensing, you know, that this is not something the enemy wants us to get into, and you don't hear uh, a lot about this. And so um, today, I want to I want to go there. On the verse, it, it's out of Matthew nine thirty eight, and it says, "So pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into His harvest." And I want to say more about that as we get into it. But but think about that. So pray to the Lord of the harvest. The last harvest that is coming, the harvest that Jesus talked about in Luke 11, in Matthew 9, and in uh, in the New Testament, he he he's several times he made this he gave this instruction to pray to the Lord of the harvest, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Get that? Pray to the Lord, the the one who is over the harvest. And here's what we're, he didn't say pray for, he didn't say pray for the harvest. The harvest, he's already, it's already there. It's already, the Bible says it's already white and ready. But what he said is pray for workers. Everybody say workers. workers. He's, and he said specifically pray that the Lord will send out workers. Amen. So now that's how we should be praying. When's the last time you spent time just asking the Lord to send out workers? Send out workers. And um, and we we know that without these workers, we're gonna, you know, we're never gonna get to the harvest. So think about it. He said, pray that the Lord of the harvest send out workers into his harvest. All right. So as we get started here, um, is it on? Yes. No. Oh, no, it wasn't on. See, that's how you have to know how to turn it on. So let's start. Let's start with this verse in Matthew 9 in its entirety, verses 36 through 38, because it's important to see it in context. Amen? Amen. All right. And, And notice the header I have here is keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. How, how important is that in life, in, in, especially in church? Because it's easy to get distracted. And so he, you know, here's Jesus giving us his church instructions, and here's what the scripture says. When he saw that the vast crowds of people, when he saw the vast crowds of people, Jesus saw vast crowds. He, people were coming out by the thousands to see and to hear Jesus. They were, they were coming out for miracles. Yes, they were coming out uh, to get fed. I mean, there was, you know, I mean, if you, if you heard, hey, there's a guy out there giving free fish lunches, wouldn't you go? Man, I'd be, I'd be there. Hey, perch dinners, all you can eat, free, I'm there. And, um, 
And, and so the crowds came. We're not going to analyze the motives of the crowds or why they were there. Jesus didn't, he didn't do that. He wasn't railing on the crowd. He, he, was, he just was, you know, the scripture says vast crowds of people were coming uh, because Jesus was doing something. He was, he was flowing in the kingdom of God, like Tommy was talking about miracles. I mean, that's as he went, miracles and, and tremendous, amazing things were happening. And, and so throngs of people were coming out and, um, because there was something to see. That Jesus was in the crowd. Jesus was there. And that should be our concern too, that Jesus is here. The church, people aren't coming here because we have a nice building. They're not coming because of the color of the carpet or the cushions in the, in the seats. Amen? Amen? They're not coming because you got the greatest pastor in the world. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> They're not coming for that. But, but, but they were coming because Jesus was manifesting the heart of the Father toward these people. Now notice what it says. It says, because Jesus' heart was deeply moved with compassion. So Jesus, he wasn't just going about a business. He wasn't just trying to build a ministry. His heart was moved. There was a, the word, that word compassion comes from a root word that talks about from deep within your bowels, there's this mercy gift that's flowing. And, and so when Jesus saw crowds, he, his heart was deeply moved, deeply moved. Because again, that's, that's what re, is re, the reflection of the heart of the Father, he is deeply moved by your infirmities. He's deeply moved by your needs. The, fa the Father is deeply moved by, the, by the, the, the lostness of our lives and the brokenness of our lives and the hurt in our lives. And he's deeply moved with compassion because here's what it says, because they seemed weary and helpless. Man, does that not describe our day too? People are weary. People are giving up. People are struggling, people are weak, and they're just like, I don't know if I can go on another day, and, and all the rates are, uh, of suicide, and, and, and self-medication, and, and self-harm, and, and just the, the, the results of, of just quitting on life are all around us. And so it, that's weary and helpless. We, we, we keep thinking, you know, I, I, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, and, and literally we're helpless. I mean, we are helpless. And so in that, I want you to think about that. As, as, the, as the description of the human condition, weary and helpless. And so now let, let's go on here and read this. It says, they seemed weary and helpless like wandering sheep without a shepherd. Now, this is the picture that he's trying to draw for us, that, that people are like wandering sheep. Sheep are, you know, notice he didn't say like they're like roaring lions and they're just on the loose, and, or he didn't say they're, they're just dirty dogs, and, or he, he didn't say they were, they were um, you know, in any other kind of animal. He called them sheep because that's, what he, that's how he looks at us. Sheep are, are, are helpless and are harmless for the most part. Hello? But the thing, the, th the greatest need, what is the greatest need of a sheep? A shepherd. Are you with me? Just bear with me. I know I'm, I'm moving slow here. I'm in, I'm just moving uh, you pray for me. I, I, I've got somewhere we're going. He says they're like wandering sheep. Wandering sheep. Man, all we like sheep have gone astray. Man, we're go people go off in so many different directions. Can you say amen? amen? People are looking for answers in all the wrong places. People keep looking right even around, you know, in, in a place like America where, 
where we've, the gospel is readily available and everything, and yet there's so, much, there's so much stuff to draw your attention and run you after this and run you after that, and this guy has the message, and that person has the way to get you the help that you need. And like, like weary and helpless people, we just keep wandering, and we go from this thing and that thing and this teaching and this religion and, and this new age thing or, or, or this hope or, or this uh, philosophy, and we say, this is going to be what you need right here. And, 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 but he, he saw us as sheep without a shepherd, so he turns to his disciples and said, now you see the context of the verse that we, we had on the first tile. The harvest is huge. The harvest is huge. The harvest is huge. The, mag, the magnitude of the harvest is huge. We're talking about the majority of, uh, of the earth is yet, to, is yet to know Jesus as the good shepherd. And so he says the harvest is huge and ripe. It's ready. Uh, people, when, when people come to the end of their way, they're ready for the answer. When people come to the, a cer certain place of hopelessness, all they need is somebody to inject into them a little hope. When people have, are in such despair, the only thing they need is somebody to come along and say, hey, I've got the answer for your despair. Amen. Amen. And, it, and, it, and we're in this position in the church today where, where the need is great and we say, well, you know, I, I don't understand it because, you know, why, why aren't people coming to Jesus? Well, I think we're going to see part of the answer to that right here the harvest is huge and it's ripe but there's not enough harvesters to bring it in that's what he said he said there's not enough harvesters notice he, he identifies a certain group of people you know a harvester someone who knows the mission Come on, help me now today. Now, I know this, this is why this is so difficult because you, you can see where I'm going here and, and this is not one of those messages that will thrill you and chill you, but it will challenge you. Because here's the, here's the thing, church. We're sitting in the day of the greatest opportunity before the church, even in America, where a lot of people are, uh, in the Christian realm are giving up. America's gone. America's uh, give up. America's, America can't come back from this. America this, America that. And, and what we've done is now we're prophesying gloom and doom, and the end is, is, the end is coming, and, and, and all, all judgment is coming, and, and, and Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he mad, and, and it's all that kind of thing. But I want to give you a different perspective. I want you to know Jesus loves the harvest. He loves the, the, the sheep that are wandering. He loves the people who are out there lost and, and everything. And what he's looking for are some harvesters who will see what he sees, who will pray in agreement with what he's praying, and who will take to task the task that he sees at hand. And, 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 and when you do that, he says, here's what, here's what happened. Pray that as you go, everybody say as you go. As you go. See, he, no, he's just assuming that it be, when you see it and when you get gripped by it, you'll just go. You will go. You cannot be indifferent and see this. It, it'd, be like, it'd be like seeing a, a double cheeseburger with mayonnaise and lettuce and onion and just saying, woo, and then walking by it. You can't do that. You can't see this harvest and just walk by it. It's well, you see how huge it is and the potential that it is, and 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 how it's just waiting to be brought in. And he says, as you go, now listen to this, plead with the owner of the harvest. This is in the Passion Translation. Plead, 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 plead with the owner of the harvest. He's using a word that's very descriptive here of how we should pray. And, and I know many people's prayers are, are gentle and meek and mild. But he's talking here about a kind of prayer that's, that's like you're going for it. Plead with the owner of the harvest to thrust out many more reapers to harvest his grain. 
That's the church's position that we should be in today. The church should be positioned right now, pleading with the Lord of the harvest. Lord, send forth labors. Lord, thrust out labors. I love this word because the word thrust out there is, is the word that's used many times through the New Testament. It's like when Jesus was, was uh, thrust out into the wilderness. The Bible says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That's the word that was used. He's, he was thrust out into the wilderness. It's the same word that's used when, when, when Tommy was telling you the story of Jesus healing the demoniac. And Jesus, it says, cast out the devil. It, it, the word is the same in the Greek. It means to thrust out. It's not like, hey, would you please leave this guy alone? And pretty please, if you don't mind, would you just back off? It was Jesus saying, get out! He thrust him out, and they were like, oh, don't send us out into the abyss. And Tommy told you the story. And, 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 you know, it is crazy to think Jesus would show any kind of mercy to the devil. But then again, the end was pretty much the same because he, the, de- the, the pigs had more sense than most believers and most of us as Christians because we'll live with devils. The pigs wouldn't even live with them. They just went in and ran into the ocean. He said, I can't have none of this. But that way, what I came to preach to you this morning. <laughs> the idea is he thrust them out. Whenever you see that word cast out, that, that went out, it's, it's the idea of being thrust out. It, listen to me. It's the Greek word ekbalo. It is the Greek word ekbalo. And so I ordered a book for this upcoming fast, which begins... Next Sunday, March 1st, because the Lord has put this burden on my heart, and I'm just here to share it with you as the church and me as your pastor. And I know it's going all over Facebook and and everything, and hundreds of people will watch this, and my challenge is to any of you because you can all come alongside, but it's not just my thing. This is actually a book called The Fast by Lou Engle. Lou Engle is the man who, back 20 years ago, began something called The Call, and he was gathering people to, to pray. And then it, it, the Lord expanded it, and, 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 and it was fasting and prayer. And, and then it became, actually la- last year, he felt like the Lord told him that I'm putting your ministry on the shelf like John the Baptist. It's run its course, and it's time for the, for the actual runner to come. Your ministry was the forerunner. And then came a ministry called The Sin. So we had the call and then The Sin. And then he said this year, God put it on his heart that if we know, we know that where the Bible says where two or three are gathered, so as they agree as anything, it'd be done by my Father is in heaven. But God burned it into his heart. What if 100 or more thousand people in this country, in America, given the state of of our nation and the state of the church in our nation, given the situations and circumstances that surround us. What if 100,000 people gathered together for 40 days from March 1st to April 9th? Thank you. And that's why she's here because she knows. I have, I have trouble remembering tomorrow. And 40 days, 100,000 people are fasting and praying, fasting and praying. And what are we praying? We're praying this very thing. Lord, thrust out, thrust out, thrust out young people, thrust out old people. There's many of you baby boomers that are like my age or even some of you are a little older. And I got a little word for you this morning. God is not done with us. We are not supposed to hang it up and take a back seat. We're supposed to rise up in our own calling to help fire this next generation and ek below. We need to ek below. We need to thrust them out. We need to pray them out. We need to speak them out. We need to hold them out and say, God, have your way for this generation. Come on now. I feel the preacher now. I'm telling you, oh, yeah, well, no, let's just wait because, you know, they're just teenagers. 
I'm here to tell you God has already shown in history what he can do through some teenagers. It was a bunch of teenagers that got together in Wales because that country was so overtaken in worldliness. Churches were dying. Churches, beautiful churches were empty on the street corners and gambling houses were full. Houses of prostitution were full. Bars and taverns were full. And a group of 17 teenagers led by a man, a young man, a very young man, I think he was 17, maybe 20. And uh, help me with his name, Julie. I just, Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts. I know this name. I've preached and read and studied history. I've studied the great, oh, great awakenings of, of the past. I've, I w- I've been doing it, uh, pouring it over it again. Because I launched this, I launched this new Facebook page. It's gonna, you're gonna have to check into, which is gonna be like kind of the seat from which we launch this whole thing right here. And it's called Awaken Northwest Indiana. You see, I want to see awakening all over this country, but I don't live all over the country. I live right here in Northwest Indiana. I'm a part of some, be- some groups of pastors and ministers that have met weekly for years. There's ministries that have been praying and praying over this this city and over this region for years. There's been a movement and many of those people have grown weary and tired and many of those people have given up but I'm here to tell you God is about to burst something when we launched into 2020 and God gave me the word that I'm going to do a new thing. See it. You got to grab hold of it. I believe God is about to launch something that's going to take this region back for Jesus. That it's not going to be just City Point Church. It's going to be the body of Christ. It's going to be the church coming back together and echoing and praying and thrusting out the sickle for the harvest is here and it is now and it is the last harvest before the end of the age. I'm here to tell you today, this isn't about just learning a soul winning plan. We've done that. I was a part of of a whole movement a few years ago where we, we, we sent people out and that's going to be a part of it. There's always the sending. There's, there's been an emphasis of that. I, I grew up in a day where we, I did uh, evangelism explosion by Dr. D. James Kennedy, who's went on to be with the Lord. And I learned how to get people cornered and tell them, if you were to die today and you were to stand before God and he was to say, why should I let you into heaven? I mean, you say, I know I'm exaggerating, but that's how it worked. I mean, I would get people like, if you were to die, I was really good at it too. <laughs> Man, I, I, I was like Jonathan Edwards. You're like a sinner in the hands of an angry God. That's how they preached back then. And we, we just scared the hell out of people. I'm not so sure many of them really fell in love with Jesus, but they knew they didn't want to go to hell. But you see, we've done that. We've done all those things, and, and I'm not saying those things were wrong or that we, we you know, that, but I'm saying it's all going to be a part. There's, there's the times God is calling the church, you know this, you know this is my heart, to get up and get out of our buildings. I want, I want to show you something. I, I know this is a little weird. You're going to have to stay with me. I'm all, I, it's already gone. I'm gone. Here we go. I, I want you to see these five pictures. These are just five pictures from when Terry and I went to Rome and, and to a few of the Greek islands. And uh, for our 45th wedding anniversary, in case you all think, hey, he's out there spending the church's money. No, I was spent my money, took my wife on an anniversary vacation <laughs> for all you that are counting. And... And, and, and man, the majority of our time we were visiting like churches because you can't go to the heart of, 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 of the of church in Italy and especially Rome where we were and everything is about the Roman Catholic Church and its world dominance. And if you see that top picture on the left, that's the, that's the uh, church of the Basilica. 
The, they say uh, the apostle Peter's bones are buried under the floor in that uh, a, a, a church. I, I'm going to call it a church. When you see that church, it's, a, it's, it's amazing. The statues, the paintings painted by masters. It's filled with millions of dollars. I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of artist, artist work. And the floors are, 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 you can't even, you couldn't replace them. Everything in it is priceless and irreplaceable. And, 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 and yet you walk into these buildings. The church on the right is a Greek Orthodox church that I think we, we took a tour of when we were in, um, I can't remember the name of the town. The, the, the church on the bottom right is the inside of a church down in, off downtown Rome, which is right near uh, the fountain. And when you walk in this building, I mean, this is, what you're, this is the foyer. Those are marble statues uh, by, by famous auth, uh, artists. And the ceilings are painted, and there's gold and velvet and... And you walk down the middle aisle of this, of this, in the, this church was in the Vatican leading into um, where Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel. And when you walk into Sistine Chapel and you see the art and, and everything and it's like, and yet here's the thing folks, 20,000 people a day go visit these buildings. But nobody's coming to Jesus. The gospel isn't being preached from these buildings. They don't even, in the Sistine Chapel, they don't have church in there. They just let people walk through and people go, ooh, ah. But I wonder how much, uh, 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 you sounds like I'm being critical of them. I wonder how many people walk in our churches. And I'm not here because, I mean, our church isn't, because we, but there are churches in America that are huge. There's churches today that are meeting over this weekend that will, will host 35,000 people. People will walk in and they'll go, ooh, ah, oh, oh. But my question is, are they coming to Jesus? I'm not here, for, I'm not here to, 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 so, so people go, ooh, ah, obviously. There's no painting on the wall here, just some pictures. That picture on the lower left is a monastery uh, that, that if you go in, it's beautiful, beautiful gardens. Are, and then there's this, this church in the middle of it. And I went in there and people were going, they, there was actually a mass being done in that thing while we were there. And we quietly walked through and I snapped a few pictures carefully so as not to disturb, but, but the artwork and the... And all the stuff in it was just amazing. The building was built back in like uh, 600. And, uh, and now it's a monastery and still occupied and being used. And, and, then, and then I saw later that priest who was doing the, was doing the, uh, the mass. I saw him downtown in that town where that monastery is and he was escorting that group of people, and, and so it was all part of like a, tra a travel deal, you know, and I just thought about how, how and again, I'm not picking on them, I'm, I'm, we've all, I'm, I'm talking about how much have we, how much have we merchandised the gospel? How much do we think it's about buildings still and that we, we need to build more buildings and we need to build bigger buildings and we need to get more people? That's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say go build buildings. Jesus didn't even have a building. Jesus didn't have a building fund. Jesus didn't worry about pictures on the wall or statues in the corners and Jesus didn't worry about even the, 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 the size of the of the congregation. He, he wasn't caught up on that. He was, he was concerned about the sheep who needed a shepherd. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so you see, this is, this is what churches has become, and even to us, these are, these are buildings that are, are hundreds and hundreds of years old. But I, I'm here to tell you something. I, I want to sound an alarm to us today because even in the American church, something's went wrong. Something has went amiss when we can, we can garner crowds and we can build buildings and we can do all those things. But the real issue, the real matter of, of, of the harvest and, and, and God sending forth the harvest to make an impact on our cities. You know, there's something wrong if you can have a church of 50,000 people in a city, but you're not making a marked difference on the city because crime is the same as any other city and everything else is the same as every other city. I want to live in a city because the church is meeting together. I, I, I remember hearing a pastor tell me that in his city, he, they met as they were meeting like we've been meeting. And they, they, got, really, they got really burdened about the, the crime wave that was going through. It was a, it was a good-sized city of about 75,000 people. And as they began praying together, and they went to the mayor even, they said, Mayor, can, would, you, would, would you bear with us because we have such a burden because the crime rate seems to be increasing and it's dangerous now to, to walk the streets of our city and so on. And the mayor said, hey, go ahead and pray. And here's, here's what happened as they met together and they even invited the mayor. The mayor got born again. No, this is, and when the mayor got born again, the mayor started praying for the city that he was the mayor of. And when the pastors and the mayor and the mayor started inviting the city officials in, the kind of invite that says, hey, you be at this meeting at nine o'clock or you're fired. And I mean, that's, sometimes that's the only way to get people together. And, and so they get, he, his officials, start, they started praying. Crime dropped in the city. I don't mean it just went down a little. Crime just literally dropped. The statistics were amazing. I can't remember what they were, but, but the, 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 because the city was being impacted by the prayer, the ekbalo, the, the sending forth of harvest workers, things were happening in the city because the city got together in the churches in the city and decided we are going to stand at our gates and pray until the Lord of the harvest hears what we have to say. I think we're in that time right now, church. I think we're in that time where God is looking for a people to pray. God is looking to get people together. I, and I, I mean on a grander scale than we've done. I know there's been little efforts. I've been a part of some efforts here and there. But I feel like God's wanting to do a brand new thing. I feel like God's wanting to do something new with you in your prayer. And how you approach prayer. Because you know, this little like, God bless Uncle Al and Aunt Susie and blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, nothing wrong with paying, praying for Uncle Al and Aunt Susie. They probably need a lot of prayer. But Jesus said, Pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he would ek below, harvest workers. Man, we, we, because we keep thinking, oh God, what's it going to take? We're wringing our hands. We're thinking, oh God, I, what's going to happen in the 2020 election? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Somebody's going to get elected. And, it, and it, here's the thing. God has not called us to cross over and become a political church. He's called us to rule and reign in the realm of the kingdom of God and not to get our hands dirty. Not, you say, Pastor Michael, are you saying Christians shouldn't vote? No. I say go do your civic duty. But don't misunderstand and think that God's going to fix this nation by some man who's going to walk into some office. What we, he's going to do is wait for the church to stand up and enter into its prayer closet. And when we intercede and we pray and cry out to God, then God is going to move because the church is here as watchmen over the city Amen. and watchmen over the nation. Let me, let me just tell you this. I, I need to say this because of the whole political realm is um, that po whole political spirit falls under the auspices of a Jezebel spirit. And you have to be really careful even as believers that we don't fall under the spell of Jezebel. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have to mull on that right there. God is looking for some prayer people. 
He's not looking for some celebrities or some people with names. He's looking for you and I to take our place. I, I got to read. Can I read something to you? I'm going to anyway. It don't matter if you give me permission. <laughs> Just thought I'd be nice and ask. You ever heard of Dick Simmons? I never had. I, I never heard. I, I never heard of him. Don't know. I never, but, but I want to show you why this name's important. Dick Simmons had no idea of the divine energy he was releasing at the midnight midnight hour as he prayed Ekbalo from Matthew nine thirty eight. Dick Simmons was a believer who, who lived uh, in New York, and New York was being ransacked by drugs and gangs and murder. And, uh, and there was just some things going on, and it was, the city was very dangerous. He felt burdened to go out to the Hudson River, and he, at the Hudson River, he, you have a view of the city, and there he began to pray, and he began to pray out loud. He prayed so loud that someone called the police on him in the neighborhood, and the police came they were going to silence him for disturbing the peace. But when they got out of the car and they realized this man was agonizing and praying to God. And he was crying for the city. And he was crying for God to send forth laborers into the city. Because the city was consumed in darkness and darkness was enshrouding it and death was all around it. When the police found him praying, they refused to disturb the praying man. On the very night he was praying, the very night he was praying, a young man in Pennsylvania, a young preacher, saw an article and a photograph in the 1958 edition of Life magazine. There was seven teenagers who were members of a gang in New York City who had been on a rampage and been arrested, and they were all young men, teenagers. His heart was broken over not just the fact that they had taken people's lives, but he, he was broken over them, that they lived in such darkness, and, and they had joined gangs. And, and the Holy Spirit, if you, when you hear his story, which he didn't know Dick Simmons either. But the same night Dick Simmons was praying, this young man fell to his knees and asked God, God, what do you want me to do? And the Lord sent this young man to New York from Pennsylvania. And there he asked for a meeting, and he went in to see these men, young men who were, who were locked up and the Holy Spirit began to open doors while he was in New York City and spoke to him about his ministry and what he was going to do there. History records thousands of drug addicts, gang members converted, a church launched in Times Square, millions impacted through the gospel. An encounter with a, a gang member named Nikki Cruz led to a book called The Cross and the Switchblade. You know who I'm talking about, right? David Wilkerson, who God thrust out, a young no-name nobody, who had no ministry to speak of. He was just a young man getting started in the assemblies of God. But his burden for New York overwhelmed him and God thrust him into a, to a difficult situation. And now today we have Teen Challenge and thousands of people have been, lives have been changed because Teen Challenge came as a result of the need that was revealed that because much of the, of the crime and much of the things going on were related to the, to the drug problem and the, and, and the drug addictions that were there. And I want to tell you something, you know, you hear a lot of stuff today about, you hear stuff about homelessness and, and it's like, oh God, how are we going to provide homes for the homeless? Here's what, here's what needs to happen because nobody's talking about the real problem. The real problem is not homelessness in America. You know what the problem is? It's drugs. Our problem is 
is drugs. And our drug addictions are creating homelessness because people have, they cannot stay in their homes when the drug addiction takes over. There's many of these people that are homeless, had jobs and had homes and had families and had careers. And when they got involved in drug addiction, but nobody wants to talk about the drug addiction. In fact, America's so smart, we decided we're going to legalize it all and we're going to take away all the, all the criminal aspects of drug abuse. How's that going to work out when the nation is given over to drug addiction and, and the same drug addiction that, that, that we look at and go, oh, isn't it terrible? You know, this thing, the church has the answer for this, folks. It's funny, David Wilkerson said that when he launched Teen Challenge, all the major secular drug rehab places were running in at about a 30 to 35 percent uh, rate of people really getting help and getting set free. And when Teen Challenge got gone, they were seeing 80 percent, 85 percent, then into 90 percent. And, pe- and they started coming to him. The leaders of the city started coming and saying, David, wh- what's the difference? What's the difference between your program and our program? We're trying to get people off of drugs. You're getting people off drugs. Our people are going back. Your people are not going back. And he said, it's just one thing. Jesus. Jesus. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. I'll tell you what people need is Jesus. And when, you, when people trade Jesus for all of their mess, when you give Jesus a place in your life, see, we've, even the, much of the churches stop preaching Jesus. We're preaching a lot of self-help, psychobabble stuff to try to help people get over their little rough patch. What you need is a good shot of Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the afternoon, Jesus in the evening. Where's the church's cry for Jesus? Many of us have become inoculated against Jesus because we got just enough of Jesus to be a immune to him. But when Jesus starts moving and says, look, why don't you let me do something with that? Why don't you let me free you from that? We say, oh, no, no, Lord, I'm good. I'm good. I got this. But then we say, Lord, go get that drug addict. Go get that, go get that pervert. Go get that person over there. And the Lord says, I will, but let me do something for you. Pray that the Lord would act below. Because let me tell you something. It's funny how in the, in the scripture, Jesus, in Matthew 9 and Luke 11, he, he, he gives this passage, a parable about the last day's harvest. And when he tells this parable, he says, he says, you know, a man went out and sowed seed and he sowed good, it says he sowed good seed. But he said, while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tares. Now listen to me, because Jesus is talking to the last day's harvest. And then the, the, the tares and the wheat grew together, and the disciples went to the master and said, should we, should we pick up all the tares? Should we get rid of, clean the tares out? And Jesus said, no. He said, because if you tear the tares out, you're going to destroy the weed in the process. Just hold tight. This is the context from which he gives this word. And, and, and this, his disciples are listening to this and they're like, what? This doesn't make any sense. I mean, aren't we supposed to keep the church clean and you know, do house cleaning on the church and, and all that? No, that's not what we've been called to do, church. You say, oh, Pastor Mike, no, listen to me. This is Jesus' church. It's, the Bible says in the last days, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But you let him do the shaking. And you let him figure out the difference between the wheat and the tares. Because many of you are driving yourself nuts trying to figure out who's, who's real and who ain't. And you're so caught up with who ain't. And we got whole, you know, like all social media is all about exposing the ain't. And while we're all caught up in the ain'ts, the whole harvest is laying in the field and not being harvested. Oh, but we got some good memes and we got some good rebukes and we got some good correction to lay on people and yet the harvest is going unharvested. So I had a dream. 
this dream has been so, so hard on me because I, I had this dream as three years ago. And I have been wrestling with this dream and wrestling with this dream for three years. I don't say much about it. I only think I've mentioned it twice. And it was so vivid. It was so real. It's one of those dreams. You know, I've, I, I don't know about you. I've had a lot of Taco Bell dreams. <laughs> but when I had this dream, I knew God was speaking to me. It was just one of those. I've only had a hand. I could count them on, on one hand, the number of dreams where I knew God was talking to me. And this is one of them. When I came came around it was and it was so vivid I had to even pinch myself is this a dream or was this a vision I, I don't know now what the Lord just brought me into an a scene where I looked for miles and it was just wheat fields and and golden heavy stalks of wheat ready to be harvested I mean it was golden ripe but there was nothing happening and there was nothing being harvested, but the fields were beautiful and, and just moving in the wind. And I guess this again, it was so vivid. And then I saw out from the distance, I saw a building. It was a nice building. It was a, it was kind of a, like a metal, uh, what, you know, like a, a pole building, but it looked, it had that appearance of it being like a church. But out of this church, a man stepped in. This man was dressed like, I knew this man was a, was a person of, like, of the cloth, I guess you'd say, just by the way he was dressed and the way he carried himself, you know, like a, like a preacher and, or whatever. And, and he had in his hands one of those, like, remote control things that you use, like, to fly remote control airplanes. And, and he steps out of the building, puts, picks this up, and starts pushing buttons I can see and then out from behind the building I see this huge combine come out and the combine is flying which I thought well this is really weird I know but the combine he was controlling it like it was an airplane and I thought oh okay so he's gonna he's gonna fly this and he's gonna land this and then he's from that place he's gonna control this harvest and he steps out and he's flying. I'm watching him and, and the thing takes a couple of circles and I'm thinking to myself, why doesn't he land this thing? Why doesn't he get to work? The harvest is getting laid. The harvest needs to be hit and, and this thing could do it. You know, combines are amazing instruments and, 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 and the combine's flying. And, and in my heart, I could hear my heart go, come on, do this, land this thing, land. He's playing with it and I'm, I'm watching it and and pretty soon he makes one final pass and he drops the remote control and he goes back in the building. And the combine just sails off till I couldn't see it anymore. And the harvest laid there and I woke up. And at first I had no clue, you know, and I went, you know how you do with dreams. Some dreams take time. Some dreams you just have to wait on the Lord. And I would talk to people and I got a little understanding here and a little understanding there. And I think it, you know, I think I got, got to all the obvious things. And the obvious thing too was like the church is failing in the harvest. Uh, the church is, you know, he, the church, he was flying this thing, but, but he was, you know, look at the technology, look at what he had in his fingertips. And, and yet they never really harvested anything because he was just having fun flying it. And a week ago, the Lord brought all this back to me, this dream, because I had forgotten it. And he spoke to me and he said, Mike, you forgot the most important part of that dream. And I'm like, what was it? And he goes, it was your reaction or non-reaction. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, all the while that thing was flying. You never spoke out. You never prayed to the Lord of the harvest. You never called out 
you stood there silent. And that's where my church is. While the harvest is great, it's ripe, but my church is silent. Because the, I assumed it was the, the fault of the guy flying it, or that I assumed too he was like a pastor. And, but what if that was the Lord of the harvest who was waiting for us to do what? Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Cry out to the Lord of the harvest. Cry out to the Lord of the harvest. Send forth harvest workers. Send forth the harvest workers. The combine represents the workers who bring in the harvest. I've been guilty of a lot of things in 40 years. You know, I've overdone some things. I've underdone things. I've tried things. I've tried. I love all this. I love all the technology we have today. Just think about it. Through that little camera right there, we, can, we have people watching in Pakistan. We've struck up some, I don't even know how it happened, but and he joins us every Tuesday in prayer. He's got a house church in Pakistan surrounded by Muslims. And the other day I knew it was coming. He said, Pastor Mike, would you please come to Pakistan? I'm like, no. It's that Macedonian call, though, church. Somebody's praying. Somebody's praying. Send for send us help, Lord. Send us some help, Lord. I don't, I'm not saying I'm their help. I'm just saying, though, when somebody prayed like Dick Simmons and said, Lord, send, send us help, send somebody. And then God moved on a young man all the way in Pennsylvania who had no connection at all to New York City. And then this young man goes to New York City and does what he does. And, and I'm telling you, all that happened because he prayed. And then people go, are you going to prayer tonight? Nah, I mean, all they do over there is pray. <laughs> and frankly, it gets a little hard. Because I pray for everything and everybody, and in 10 minutes, I'm done. And these people just keep praying, and they just keep praying. And I feel so inadequate. There's how we work our prayer meetings, folks. You come, Pray. Through this 40 days, I'm asking you to break out. You don't have to pray for hours. We're not trying to break any records. We're not trying to impress God. We're not trying to bend God's arm behind his back and say, see God, now you got to do something. No, we're just trying to be obedient to the word of God. And when you're obedient to what God says, God says, I will open up the windows of heaven and I will pour you out a blessing and there will not be room enough to receive it. I'm concerned about where we're going as a nation, where we're going as, as, a, as a country, as a, as a state. I'm concerned about the region. I'm also so concerned about this church because I'm not interested in having a little get together. I'm interested in fulfilling what God has called me to do. And with what days I have left, I'm going to be calling for the ekbalo of God. I'm fasting and praying for God to raise up workers who will take this nation, take this region, take this church, take this city for Jesus. And if you want to be a part of that, I need you to come alongside and I need you to come and let's pray and let's cry and let's see God do something. Stand your feet with me. Ooh. Ooh, stand. Everybody stand. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Say not, there are four months, and then come harvest. But I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the field, for it is white, it is ripe, and it is all ready to harvest. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest would ekbalo, would send forth labors.
I ordered about 20 of these to start with. I think we have about 11 or 12 left. These books, you can get them on Amazon if, if and when we run out. I don't want to just hand out books, but if you're, if you're willing to join and you're willing to really come alongside because what we're going to do starting March 1st, which listen, here's what's really cool about this. I just have this sense, you know, that, that and I talk to, to the leaders and things, and you know, we're, you, know what, you know what March 9th is? It leads up all the right, right to the weekend of Easter. This 40 days falls right in line with Lent. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a religious person. I don't get caught up in, in religious things. I, I, I personally, you know, I have a disdain for people who give up chocolate for Lent when you need to give up your sin. Yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to eat potato chips for 40 days. Okay. What a sacrifice. But I but I I feel like this is something I I feel like this year rather than us we put a bunch of plans and programs I told the leaders I feel like this Easter something something is going to happen in a monumental way for the harvest. That we should, for this Easter, we shouldn't go after just, just uh, having a nice service and then go home and have a nice ham dinner. That we go after souls. How about it, church? We go after the lost. We go after people who need Jesus. And we don't just worry about having a slick program or a nice song, but we go, we pray and we seek God and we call till the power and the presence of God is so thick that people just come to Jesus by, by the droves because of the presence of God. See, that's what you call an awakening. You see, it's on my heart. I've been studied. I've studied my life. I have books and notes and things. In fact, I came here today to talk to you about the first great awakening and the second great awakening and then the third great awakening. I, 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 there's so many great things to share in all this. But here, let me tell you something. Every awakening came because the church had fallen into a place where it was asleep, it was ineffective, and it was unfruitful. And then people began to cry out. And when people began to cry out, the likes of Jonathan Edwards rose up, the likes of George Whitfield. You know, it was, this is back in the 1740s. George Whitfield rode a horse from the northern colonies down to the south and preached to over a half a million people without the aid of a microphone or a PA system or Facebook. And when George Whitfield was done, our nation was changed. And guess what happened out of the 1740s and 50s? The very nation of America was birthed in the throes of a revival. And folks, if we want to keep our nation, then it's going to take a revival. Oh, no, no, no. Our politicians are gonna got this. Let me tell you something. Without revival, without revival, no politician can save us. I just want us to get still for a minute. I'm out here to work something up. I've tried that too. I've tried to work up an excitement, work up people to do something. And I've tried to work people to get them to participate. And I've tried to work people to try to guilt them or try to, to move them to something. And I realize that's just a flesh. That's just, that's just not going to get it done. Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. fall fresh on us. Spirit of the living God, awaken us.
truly, Lord, the harvest is ripe. It's plentiful. Where are the laborers? Where are the intercessors? Where are the harvest workers? You gave us and continue to pour on us your Holy Spirit. Today, Lord, I thank you for your presence in this place. And everybody look at me for one second before I, I close. I love the presence of God. I love worship. We're always going to give way to the Holy Spirit. We're always going to chase Him, pursue Him, run after His presence. We're always going to make room for Him. Only the, only the Holy Spirit can really affect any real change in us. As we allow him to move us upward to him but let me tell you how you know you've had a move of God now listen to me because this is where a lot of people miss it right here because they have the move of God in a in a in the miracle or in the manifestation in the gift not against <laughs> no and I'm not against manifestation I'm not against miracles I'm not against the gift but now listen to me How you know that you have been genuinely touched and affected and impacted by God is what happens on the inside of you on the heels of that encounter where you're not infatuated with the smoke or the fire or the cloud or the angels but think about Isaiah Isaiah chapter 6 when he was drawn up into the presence of God drawn up into the throne room saw the angels cry holy 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 Isaiah goes upward, and as he moves upwards, he gets convicted, and he cries out, God, I am undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the people of unclean lips. And the angel, it says, took a fire, a coal from the altar, and touched his lips, and said, lo, this has purged your lips and cleansed you. And I mean, there's, like, there's ministry going on there. That's what real worship and what real ministry is all about. It's not just goosebumps. It's about being drawn in the presence of God and the presence of God changing you and transforming you and reshaping you and cleansing you of the things that are in your life. Now listen to this. When Isaiah got done, the Lord asked this question. He said, who will go for me? Who will go for me? And whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, here I am send me bow your heads now would you please I promise I'll let you go I will let you go but I got this promise for you the Holy Spirit will not let you go He is going to work. He's going to speak. He's going to wake some of you up in the midnight hour. Some of you are going to have dreams and visions. Some are going to prophesy. And on our sons and daughters, He will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. And the answer of the church in this day and this hour will be, here we are, Lord. Send us. Father, I pray today that as you move through this place right now in this time of consecration, and that's in, indeed what this is, it's a time of consecration. Where we consecrate our hearts to the Lord. You said, consecrate yourselves, for in about three days, 
you are going to cross over. Wow. Father, I pray for a spirit of consecration to come to your church right now. All over the body of Christ, all over the, all over the country, all over this region. I pray, God, for a consecration to come on us. That we separate ourselves unto you and say, here I am, Lord. Send me. I'm going to invite our prayer team, our elders, pastors to come to the front. I really feel like we need to fulfill this prayer. I know this is different. This is a little different. I'm not asking, you know, if you need Jesus, then um, I want you to come right over here. But if you are, if you hear what I'm saying today, he that hath an ear, if you hear what I am saying today and you believe that I've been called to be a part of this last day's harvest, the last harvest, the harvest that will represent the end of the age. I didn't say the end of the world. You know, in the King James, it says end of the world, but the word world there is age. The church age is going to come to an end at Jesus coming, but that doesn't mean the world is going to end. Jesus has some things he's going to finish up with Satan, with the millennial reign, with Israel. All kinds of things are going to unfold. But as far as the church age, it will be over. And the harvest will be ended. So if you're not saved, I want you to come over to this side here. But if you are a believer who needs and wants and feels and senses the need to awaken, I need an awakening in my life. I want to be part of the awakening. This will be the great awakening to end all awakenings as the last harvest comes. And you want to be a part of that then I invite you to come this morning. I invite you to come and, and pray. You don't, even have to, you don't even have to come in front of anybody. You can come and find yourself a place to pray and consecrate yourself between the Lord. But I think it'd be good if we got in agreement and you got, you got somebody to get in agreement with you and pray for you, prophesy over you. Maybe God gives them a word for you. I felt like I, it's already been working. Omar, God's got to work for you. I don't even know you. I don't even know you, but I know God's calling is real. And, and what God has for you, your eye has not seen. Your ear has not heard. And it has not even entered into your heart yet what God has for you. And I'm just saying, God, have your way in Omar today. I'm saying to you today, come forward, come and get prayer, come and let's, let's cry out for awakening. Come and let us get an agreement that the Lord of the harvest would ekbalo, would send forth labors into this harvest today. Come on church, come on, it's time for the church to seek, to ask, to knock, to pray to the Lord of the harvest. Come on, this is beyond just anything else we have ever done. It's time for awakening. It's time for an outpouring. It's time for revival. It's time for renewal. It's time for restoration. If you need Jesus, you come right over here by Paul. If you need Jesus, trust me, if you're, out, if you're in a place where you're without Jesus, we're going to fix that right up. But if you're a believer and you just want, you want God's touch and you want an awakening in your life and in your family and in your city, in your church, in your life, then come and let's pray and seek the Lord together. Come on, come on, come on. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Come on, you never come on. Stop working. Uh. Yeah. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You 
Darkness, 